What is going on, everybody? I'd like to welcome everybody. You know, today is my special day. Uh, I don't know about you, Gus, but I'm feeling 22 because I did just turn 22 today. Uh, always a good day. You know, I wouldn't want to be anywhere else other than talking about Beaver football on my birthday. Uh, so let's get right into it, Gus. How you doing, man? How, how, how are you doing? I heard you're moving into a new house. Big things going on in the Light family. How's everything been going? Steph, everything is going great. The only thing I'm sad about is I can't be with you and Corvallis right now to celebrate the big old 2-2. But, you know, it's probably the second best thing we do is get together and do a podcast on your big day. That being said, Hef, let's get right into it. I know uh, we don't want to beat around the bush here. You want to talk some Beaver football your 22nd year? That's what we're going to do. First off, before we can get a chance on, I know we can see what the title says. Chris says happy birthday to you. What a nice guy. But and before we even get into what the title says, just what are your overall impressions of the game against Utah this week? Uh, a rough one, I will say. Uh, but thank you, Chris, first off and foremost. Uh, thank you, Chris, for the happy birthday. I appreciate that. Uh, overall, man, just a tough, tough game to watch. And, you know, that's just the bottom line when it comes to that game is that we didn't have Jamar Jefferson – Jebby was out, starting quarterback, knows the system, has been in there since the beginning of the season, knows what he's doing, knows how to run that off offense. Even though, I, you know, I harp on him all the time about how I don't think he's doing great, he still runs the offense really well. And he knows what he's doing. He knows how to lead his guys. And I just don't think Chance Nolan knew how to do that right away, especially coming into, you know, his first game in an actual big-time football game compared to his Juco days at Saddleback. So – just a, a wounded Beavers team going up against a Utah team that didn't look as strong as, you know, previous years and how good those other Utah teams have been. Mm-hmm. Nonetheless, Utah played a really good game. You know, Britton Covey came out and did his thing. Um, nothing you could do at that point. When you got injuries and, and you're struggling to get it going on offense, you know, there's just nothing you can do against a team that's as well coached as Utah. Yeah. No, I'm right there with you. It was a very frustrating game to watch, and I think I can now – I finally know what um, Pac-12 after dark consists of. The Martin is in Colorado, Mountain Time, and the game literally ended after midnight my time. So I was up all night, and for really three and a half quarters of that game, there's not a lot for the Beavers, Beavers fans to cheer for. With that being said, there are a couple positives coming out of this game, and two people in particular i got to give a shout-out to are Avery Roberts, played like a man – 21 tackles. He's just been on a tear. He played phenomenally. He was all over the field against Utah. I really want to give a shout-out to him. And then also Coach Smith. If I had any doubts of man for the job prior to this season, and I expressed those after the last two weeks against the Ducks and now against Utah, I really have no doubts about him because we were down 30-10. to 10. The game looked over. I was ready to turn it off, go to bed. He brought us back. You saw him on the sidelines. He's still yelling at the offense. He's getting animated. And the offense comes back. We score a touchdown. We do a ballsy onside kick that he calls or covers it. And we almost came back and won that game despite being, despite looking like we had no shot. We were dead in the water there. So I want to give a shout out to Coach Smith. I want to give a shout out to Avery Roberts. And then one other guy too, Calvin Tyler Jr., the running back. I know he didn't have a great game statistically, but coming into the game, he, he's a senior this year. And his three years here at Oregon State, he's had 15 carries total in his career. And he had 15 more this last week. So I thought that was cool for him to finally get some playing time. And just being thrown out there, it's basically put in a position to fail. And I think considering he had basically no first team reps all week, I'm proud of the way he played. And I think he showed uh, the kind of that next man up mentality. But let's uh, kind of transition to this half. We've been probably the one of the most things we've discussed the most throughout this whole season is who should play QB. We've jumped back and forth. Even before the season, you said Jibia, I said Nolan. And we finally got our first look at Chance Nolan. What is your overall first impression of him? So I know, Chris, you're in the chat. You're not going to like this take. You know, me and you were talking about this during the game. Um, I will admit that Chance Nolan did not play well in his first start. But, and this is a big but, like I said earlier, first start in a big-time conference, first time in, you know, Division one college football in general. And he comes out and, you know, throws for 202 yards, might not have had the most astounding game, but 
there's a difference between guys that come in and do their for you know get their first actual chance at being at the helm of the offense, and they either shine or they don't. There is no real in between, and I feel like Chance Nolan he didn't shine, but there was still some glimpses of what he can do. We saw it when he could get out of the pocket and you know make something out of a play that originally would have been dead if Tristan Jebbia was in at quarterback. So I, it's just the things that he, the little things that he did were impressive to me compared to, you know, the overall thing, like we didn't win. He might not have threw for over 300 yards and three touchdowns and had some astounding game, but he still did little things that were a glimmer of hope for the rest of the season, especially if Jebby is not going to be in there anymore. I'm right there with you. I honestly, I'm encouraged. I'm, I don't want to say I'm encouraged by this game, but I'm not discouraged by it. I think he went out there. He was put in a position to fail. Like I said, he didn't have Jamar with him. He was going against a Utah team who was very well coached, one of the best coached teams really in the nation. You've seen what they've done over the past couple years, how they've turned that program to one of the most stellar programs in the whole Pac-12. He didn't have Jamar, like I said, and he still went out there and he was competitive on the road in his first career start. I'm glad you brought up the rushing numbers because even though it wasn't as impressive statistically as either of us would like to see, I want to throw this out at you. Tristan Jibia threw four games this season. He has 18 rushing attempts for negative 18 yards for four games. Chance Nolan in his first career game had 13 rushing attempts for 36 yards. Obviously that's not great. 13 attempts for 36 yards took a couple huge sacks. There's some, there's definitely more he can do. But you could just see it. It opens up our offense. I just, I feel like a first real good judgment of him will be when we have Jamar. If we can start running RPOs with him and Jamar, because we're running some of those RPOs and the defense wasn't putting all their attention towards Calvin Tyler Jr. Just because he's not as, he's not the same level of back as Jamar is. You give um, a guy like Nolan a back like Jamar, I feel like that's going to open a lot more running lanes for both of them, and it's going to help our offense become even more explosive. No, yeah, I agree. And I, I think that one of the things that could really be one of the factors into why he might not have played as well is that, you know, like the guy got thrown in and yeah, he might've had a week to prepare for that Utah game, but he's been getting maybe practice squad reps, you know, here and there in practice, but all season, the guy hasn't really been doing anything to make him a star caliber starting quarterback in the Pac-12. And nobody expected Jebby to get hurt. And obviously, if you're Chance Nolan, you need to be ready and you need to be ready to step up immediately. But you can't put all of the blame on him when the star running back is out, which takes away the running game completely. Not only is the star running back out, but the second string gets hurt within the first quarter. So now we got our third string running back in. We got our second string quarterback in. Everybody knows that the rushing game is going to be abysmal, especially against Utah. They didn't really give him a chance, you know, like, and like you said, the cards were just stacked against him from the beginning. I can't get too angry at him for his performance. Like I would like to see better, but there's still, you know, there's a silver lining to this all. He's a good quarterback. He has potential and he can definitely make it happen if he has, you know, the weapons around him and the opportunities to actually get it done. And you could see it too, that this was not just a, like the, he didn't play to his full potential. You could see he was clearly nervous early on. His first throw of the his first career throw was an interception. That was the only interception on the game. He, he each quarter it seemed like he got better, and in, into that fourth quarter he looked very poised in some of those drives. He led us down the field, converting on multiple third downs, a couple fourth down conversions. He looked a lot better, and that's why overall, well, he didn't wow me. I'm not gonna look at this now, and I'm not so high on the Chance Nolan train, but I really want to see him with Jamar, and I think how he does. When he has that first game with Jamar, hopefully it's this week. We'll see if Jamar gets cleared. But I want to see how he does when he has the same weapons Jebbia has because then I think it's more fair to compare the two. With that being said, he came in here, had his third string running back, first career start on the road against Utah, a very good program, and gave us a chance to win. He still gave us a chance to win, which what happened against the last year against Utah? We lost like 50, 57, 55 to 30 seven or whatever it was, you know, we didn't have a shot to win last year. So I'm not saying that's all on Nolan, obviously, but he put us in a better position than we have been in years past. And for a first career start, I think that's all you can really ask for. Let me ask you this though, Hef. Say Jebbia was healthy and could get ready to go this week. And it was between Jebbia and Nolan. Now me and you both know that Jebbia is not going to be able to start, but just hypothetically, they're both healthy. Which one would you be starting this week? 
So coming off of the injury, like he got injured no, against. No, say there was no injury, just healthy. No injury at all. Yeah, no would you still be on the Nolan? Or you would you do you think? I guess do you think Nolan deserves to be the starter, or do you think he's? Would you go with Jibby if he was healthy? I'm still on the Nolan train. I do have to say I'm still on the Nolan train. Um, you know, the fact that 202 yards and one interception is bad compared to well, that's that's another thing I don't understand. A lot of people are going to say 202 yards, you know, one interception and how, how many ever touchdowns he threw is not a good game when comparatively our previous starting quarterback in week two threw for 85 yards. <laughs> I mean, I granted, I give it to Jebbia. He really showed up in that second half of that Oregon game, but Nolan has shown me more potential than Jebbia has shown me in f- three to four weeks of a whole, like, you know, not a whole season, but a shortened season. Most of this shortened season has been Jebbia. We've had a lot of time to see him. I- I've had more encouragement with Nolan, even mm-hmm. in that first game, him not being, you know, him still being shaky and not the greatest. I still think he's better than Jebbia. I really, yeah. I- I'm right there with you. And, I keep going back to it, but I'm not going to write off Nolan until I see him play with the same weapons that Jibby has had. I'm telling you right now, if Jamar can run for five yards a carry, six yards a carry, run for 150 yards a game with Jibby, who has no mobile threat at all, imagine how much he's going to be able to run the ball when he has a probably the second best runner on the team and the defense has to decide, do you want Nolan to run on you or do you want Jamar to run on you? When I see that, hopefully this week, I think that's going to be a great indication of how good of a um, starter he'll be. With that, Dave in the chat, he said, "I'm riding with Jibia. He beat Oregon and earned the job." Dave, and that's a that's definitely a fair point. The thing is, luckily, I think for Coach Smith's sake, he doesn't have to make this decision because Jibby is heard to be a much tougher decision if Jibby was healthy. But yeah, there's there's reasons to start both of them. I think, like you said, Hef, I think Nolan has a much higher ceiling. And for that reason, I think we ride with Nolan and then hopefully he can start picking up some ground. And then next year when we have that full season, Nolan can hit the ground running and our offense will be explosive with him. Yeah. I, one of the counterpoints I'd like to send over to Dave, I do agree. Jebbia, you know, he, I wouldn't say he beat Oregon, but Jebby had earned another week in that Oregon game. Jamar Jefferson beat Oregon if we're being honest with completely and utterly honest, Jamar Jefferson beat Oregon without Jamar Jefferson rushing for 226 yards and two tuds, that pass game isn't going to be even anywhere near as open as it was for Jebby in that fourth quarter, even in the third quarter, like he started slinging the rock because Oregon realized that, Oh wow. The running back is destroying us. Maybe we should focus on that. And they came out and they focused the run game and Jebby got it done. But if it takes Jamar Jefferson, rushing for so many yards just to get Jebby going, then, you know, what, what can you say? Also, to respond to Chris saying Nolan is a lot less accurate, yeah, that's true, but I, I, I just don't think you're taking into account that this was his first game. I know it's it's hard and tough to really, like, look at a player and expect him to do great in his first game, especially coming out of JUCO in a Pac-12 school. Like, it's not like he's a Juke of product coming out and playing in the SEC. No shots at the Pac-12, but, you know, it's Pac-12 football. You're not going to expect this guy who gets, you know, sent to a Pac-12 school to come out and be the next Heisman quarterback. You know, he, he did the best that he could with the weapons that he had. Uh, and that's that's how I'll that's how is, end that one. I want to add on to that real quick, Hef. The other thing is, every start that Jibby's had, and some of the people in here are defending Jibby, and that's fine. I understand the points. But every start Jibby has had, the opposing defense has been daring us to throw the ball. They have been stacking the box in Jamar and doing every receiver in one-on-one coverage. This game was the opposite because we had no rushing attack at all because Jamar and Baylor were both out. So defenses were trying to, were letting us run the ball. They're defending the pass, and no one still put up better than Jibia has for every single game except for one this season. So I know we have the recency bias of how well he played against Oregon, but look at him against Washington State, look at him against Washington, and look at him and look at look at his stats against Cal. He was not great for four games this season. He was great for two quarters this season. So I think Nolan, his potential, his dual threat ability is really intriguing and adds another dimension to our offense. And again, everyone defend him. We didn't have Jamar this game. Jamar's been our offense for four game for every single game he's been in there. Jamar's been our offense. It hasn't been Jibia. Yeah. Anyway, Hef, it's your birthday. Let's move on to a bit more of a fun topic. 
We, as we know, we're going into the last regular season game of the season. We're off to a two and three start. Have what have been the best and worst moments for the Beavers in your perspective so far this season? Before we start this topic, I would like to shout out Joska and Bassam. Thank you for the happy birthdays. Sorry to keep interrupting the show with the happy birthdays, but you know, got my people in here. Want to give them a shout out. Uh, also, to respond to Joska's comment. Uh, saying also Chance Nolan looked very scared every snap. You saw his face looking at the sidelines. That is true. Chance Nolan did look very nervous when he was playing in that game. That was definitely a factor into why I think that he was less accurate and played, you know, not as good. But moving on to the second topic, what have been the best and worst moments of the season? Let's go with the best. Let's start off with the best, Gus. My best moment, I have two. I'm going to go with two because one of them is an obvious one. One of them is a less obvious one. The most obvious one is beating the Ducks. Everybody in here can agree. Mm -hmm. Everybody in the chat can agree. Anybody watching, anybody that's a Beaver fan can agree that the best moment of this year is beating the Ducks. We could not win another game. We couldn't have won any game from the first few weeks of the season and beat the Ducks and then lost every game out after that. I don't care. We beat the Ducks. Top moment for me this season. My second best moment, I would have to say that first rush against Cal for Jamar Jefferson. That's where I really started to believe that Jamar is NFL caliber talent, you know, getting drafted in the second, third round kind of talent. That was an incredible run. And I would love to say the one against Oregon because that was his, you know, season long, but that whole game as a whole for Jamar Jefferson was a best. And the whole game as a team was a best, but more specifically that run against Cal was absolutely ridiculous. Dude looked like Marshawn Lynch against the saints Shout out to the Saints, Dave. But yeah, that would be my best moment. Beating the Ducks and Jamar Jefferson really proving himself in that Cal game. Yeah. Well, obviously, my number one is beating the Ducks, too. That's not only the best moment for the season. That's the best sports moment I have had. Maybe – is that better than when we won the national championship in baseball our freshman year? That's an honest question. I think a lot more people care about beating the Ducks – Either way, for me personally, it might not be, but that's a top two moment sports-wise I've had in four years here at Oregon State, so that's number one by far. The second one, it was in that Cal game too, but it was that game ceiling interception we had with about a minute left. I remember we were watching that. A ton of people were over, and that was just – I was watching the replay today, and what I didn't realize is how high up that ball got deflected by um, um, Achille Avery. He literally – that thing was like 15 feet in the air – Game ceiling pick, first one of the season. I thought it was great. Kind of, I don't, I think if we lose that cow game, we probably don't beat the Ducks. We rode that momentum into the Ducks game. And that was really a defining moment for that defense, I feel like. I feel like that's when the defense started to believe in themselves. They proved they could force turnovers. They forced three more against Oregon the next game. That was a huge moment. And I think it was cool to see us win a game from our defense for once because we don't really see that a whole lot here at Oregon State. Yeah, no, I agree. That was definitely another good moment of that Cal game was the ending. I mean, and even the ending against the Ducks when, you know, yeah. Jaden Grant intercepted that pass. Like that, the defense and Jaden Grant more specifically is another best in yeah. overall for the season is that he has stepped up a walk on coming from West Lynn, I believe. And that was he from West Lynn? I know you're in the chat. I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure he's from West Lynn, but yeah, Bassam can confirm if he's from West Lynn or not. Uh, but, like, he stepped up in ways that I couldn't have even believed this season. You know, I follow him on Instagram. I follow him on Twitter. I follow a lot of our players on Instagram and Twitter. And I'm pretty sure he just won an award for, you know, his play this season. So, shout out to Jaden Grant, man. You've been doing your thing. Uh, keep it up. Yeah. Worst moment of the season. I want to hear yours first, Gus. Tell me your worst moment. Bassin, thank you for confirming that. You're kind of like our Westland Woj, so I appreciate that. That's a Westland bomb. He, Jaden Grant is from Westland. It is, in fact. The worst moment, I have two. These are both – okay, I'll say this one is the number one worst moment, was just that Washington State game overall that – um just I just remember going to that game. We had a huge group watching that, and we were all so hyped. We said, like, this season's going to be different. And we just looked so flat against Washington State, and they really just came out and killed us. And it kind of ruined all the momentum. It, it made me regret a lot of things I was saying coming into the season because I was saying how Washington State was going to be an easy win. You bet your hair on it. And just for us to get demoralized like that, it sucked. The second worst moment is definitely the refs screwing us over in that UW game. I felt like we got the first down twice. 
Well, I don't believe we deserve to win that game because we played so poorly. Washington State basically tried to give us the game. Thing is, if we get that first down, which we rightfully should have, not once but twice, but if we get that first down, there's a realistic shot. We win that game, and we start our season 3-1, and one, which would have been sweet. But those are my top two. I'd say how poorly we played against Washington State, given how high my personal expectations were for that game and for that team. And then number two, the Pac-12 refs conspiring against us to make sure we lost. Yeah, I I want to throw those two things in my one and two, but I'm going to switch it up a bit for the sake of the show. Um, my worst moment, you know what, I'm going to keep one. My worst moment was the UW one. I mean, that was ridiculous. Like you said, Pac-12 refs have been – oblivious to everything all season, not even just for the Beavers. There's been so many Pac-12 games this season where we've seen those refs look like they have absolutely no idea what's going on and they look blind. But, you know, number one, that UW game. Number two, I'm going to go with – hmm, this is tough because there is a few. I'm going to go with the Utah game. It's very recent, but going into that Utah game – and talking to Cole over at Ute Dash, the fact that the Ute Dash said that they believed that they were the underdogs coming into this game gave not only me a lot of confidence in our team, but you know a lot of our viewers a lot of confidence that a team as well coached as Utah is supposedly the underdog on you know in during that game. Going into that game, I expected us to do a lot better, and I also wasn't really aware that Jamar Jefferson was going to be put on COVID protocol until a few hours before the game. So leading up into that game, just the fact that Jamar got put on the COVID protocol, Jebby got hurt against Oregon. The odds were stacked against us going into that Utah game. And when we get into that Utah game, the fact that we lost by a little hurt more than us losing by a lot, you know, because the fact that we shouldn't have even been in that game one way or the other with the amount of, you know, injuries and people we had out and blah, blah, blah. We shouldn't have been in this then that game as close as we were, but you know, that would be my second worst moment is that we should have won that Utah game, man. And I'm still, I'm still stuck on that Utah game. I had that written down as my third worst moment. And specifically, I don't, I can take it or leave it. We've lost so many games that were way more disappointing, way more discouraging that Utah game in our four years here at Oregon state that I'm not, even though I think we should have won that game, we could have won that game. I'm not stuck on it because I've seen this script a million times. The thing that was really disappointing about that game for me, Jamar being on put in COVID protocol, because really he had offensive player of the year in the back 12 locked up as far as I'm concerned through his first four games. And he had to come out here in his fifth game. He just had to have an average performance by his standards, and he would have still been the front runner. Well, I still think he is the front runner. I know CU's running back. He rushed like 300 yards this week. He's making a case for himself. CU's undefeated. It's just that I feel bad for Jamar that he's having what potentially could be his last college season cut even shorter than it already is because of COVID. And hopefully it wasn't a result of him being reckless. I doubt it would be due to his high character that he's um, demonstrated. But it was it was sad for him and for Beavers fans. I think if he's healthy, I think we win that game. And for him to be put on COVID hours before the game, it was it was really disheartening. Um, how much time we got? Maybe oh, we should probably move on to our third topic hef we as uh we know we're playing stanford this week they've been kind of a scrappy team really weird they lost to um oregon i believe to start the season then barely lost to cu who's undefeated and then they barely lost to cal by one point and then they came out and beat washington last week so they've been a very interesting team kind of up and downs it's kind of representative of the whole conference if you ask me is that the Pac-12 is just so even this year. I literally feel like anyone can beat anyone in this conference. But have what are your initial thoughts of this game? Maybe give a couple keys to victory and just your overlying um, what your expectations are for this game. Um. Well, I mean, just in general, the Beavers need to come out and play. Like that, and I say that every week, it's a very obvious statement, but the fact that I have to keep repeating that is, you know, in- indicative of the situation that we're in as Beaver fans and Beaver reporters and analysts and blah, blah, blah. The Beavers need to come out and play bottom line. Because last week until the fourth quarter-ish, maybe end of the third, they didn't come out to play. Regardless of who we were missing, they didn't come out to play. Even if they did have who they had, would they have came out to play? Who knows? This week, and especially going up against a team that we know is iffy, and no offense to Stanford fans, no offense to Stanford, you know, Cardinal Dash, Stanford's iffy. Like you said, you know, 
barely losing to Cal and then beating Oregon. Like you know, it, it's, it's, it's things like that, that don't really put them on my radar as a team that we should be afraid of, but mm-hmm. it's about respect. And it, if the Beavers can respect Stanford for what they're doing and Stanford respects the Beavers for what they're doing in the sense that when you respect a team, you prepare for them. Right. Mm-hmm. And if you, you know, go half in on your preparations, you don't respect that team. And that team can come out and smack you in the mouth and, you know, win that game by a lot more than you would have expected them to have ever won. So it's about respecting the Sanford team. If the Beavers come out, prepare and get ready this week and really prepare Chance Nolan for what he needs to do, I think the Beavers can come out. and, and Not easily, but they, they can get that dub with at least a 7 to 14 point margin. Yeah, I like what you're saying because – so often, Coach Jonathan Smith, he's been talking about how this is the rebuild. We're reestablishing the culture here at Oregon State. And, yes, some of that means that we show up for the big-time games. We beat Oregon, right? That's a signature win. But what that also means when you're shifting the culture is you show up for every single game. Stanford, they've been going downhill, really, ever for the last few years, right? I can't remember a time they've been, like, a national contender since they have Andrew Luck. Maybe I'm wrong there. Someone correct me if I'm wrong. But if we want to really be – a, have a new culture here at Oregon State, these are games we need to be better than Stanford. We need to consistently beat them, right? Establishing a new culture means you're going to show up every game. It doesn't mean just playing our best against our most hated rival and then getting that one signature win and playing half ass the rest of the season. That being said, I got three keys to victory for this week. The number one is we can't turn the ball over. Stanford has been really solid this season, not turning the ball over. They have a senior QB, Davis Mills. He's only played three games for them this year. But in those three games, he has 784 passing yards, so averaging over 250 passing yards a game. Three touchdowns, zero turnovers. He has zero fumbles, zero interceptions. He's been really solid at taking care of that ball. On the other hand of it, they have a lot of takeaways. They've taken away the ball six times. They turned over twice this entire season. And that's really been the reason they've been able to stay in these games and win them. The second one is we need to put pressure on Davis Mills. He's barely been sacked this whole season. We have a great linebacking core. We have a great defense. If we can put pressure on him, make him feel uncomfortable, I think that'll be huge. And then the last one, this is obvious, but I'm telling you, if Jamar is healthy, we're winning this game. I don't care. I know he's going to be healthy. I know that broke his heart that he couldn't play against Utah and avenge last season when we lost like 49 points. If he's healthy, we're going to win this game. That's a huge if. It's looking like, based on an article I read earlier today, that he's there's it's basically a 50-50 chance he'll be cleared in time. So if he's cleared, I think we win that. But regardless, we can't turn the ball over, and we need to get some. We need to get a whole game out of our defense. I think we've played really good situationally in the last couple games, but we need to play a whole game and treat the first quarter like the fourth quarter on the defensive side of the ball. No, yeah, I agree. Um, it's just going to be a tough thing. I'll give you my three points, but first thing I would like to say is that it's going to be tough transitioning Jamar and Chance Nolan together. I know they have a whole week to do it, but that's definitely going to be one of the tougher things is, you know, chance in that game was more used to our third string running back compared to our star running back. So seeing that transition is going to be very interesting, but my first, that actually goes into my first point that to win this game, chance Nolan and Jamar Jefferson are going to have to be in sync, you know, because chance can get out of the pocket and make things happen. And obviously we know Jamar Jefferson's a star running back. No doubt about it. Any way you look at it, he's a star running back. Um, the second key to this victory is limiting the turnovers. You know, like first pass of his you know, Oregon State career, Chance Nolan throws an interception. Granted, he didn't have any more the rest of the game, but, you know, that weighs on a guy's mind when the first pass you throw at your new starting position is an interception. So shaking that off and making sure that there's no turnovers, especially on the offensive end. Um, well, I mean, there can only be turnovers on the offensive end, but you know what I'm saying. Yeah. Um, third point. I'm going to say it again, Jamar, Jamar, Jamar. I say it every week, but, you know, Jamar, Jamar, Jamar. Everybody knows what Jamar, Jamar, Jamar means. Get the man the ball, NFL caliber talent, put it in his hands, let him do his thing. That's basically it. That's basically it. If we do those three things, I would have no doubt in my mind that we can beat the Stanford team. I agree with you. I think, like I said, this Pac-12 is so even. I literally think every any team can beat anyone. For that reason, I'm predicting the Beavers are going to inch out a close one. I think we're going to see a lot of great offense and some big plays with Nolan and Jamar hopefully being teamed up for the first time. But I'm going to say we're going to win a close one. I'm taking Beavers 31-28. What do you have, F? Um, I'm going to go a more lower scoring game because I think that both defenses are going to, you know, 
give it their all. Our defense has been stepping up, and like you said, that Stanford defense has a lot of take, takeaways this year. So I'm going to go 24-21 Beavers. I think it's a field goal win. Well, that sounds good, Half Happy birthday. The whole chat, thank you guys for being here. Half, you're the man, 22 years old. Hope you have a great night tonight. Why don't you just send us out and say goodbye? Yep. Thank you, everybody, for coming out, listening to us pitter-patter about the Beavers like we do every week. Uh, thank you for coming and celebrating my little birthday Beaver Dash here. Uh, yeah, if you uh, – we have columns published exclusively with our partner, Sports Pack 12 You can find all those articles at sportspack12.com or follow them on their social medias at SportsPack12. If you want to see more shows like this, Beaver Dash or Bear Dash, Cardinal Dash, we got Husky Dash, we got Wazoo Dash, we got every dash you could possibly want, come on down to dashsports.tv and come check out these dashes or follow us on uh, our social medias at dashsportstv. Um, yeah. That was it. Great show. Everybody, have yourself a great night. I know I will. Adios.